please all kneel? Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was burned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our 
offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living, and smitten for the sin of his people. A grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evil doers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant will justify many and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sin of many and win pardons for their offenses. The word of the Lord. to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They will see me abroad and flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead 
I am like a dish that is broken. Trust is in you, O oh Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted. All you who hope in the Lord. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord.
passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene. Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribunal, the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had consoled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now, the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter. He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around the charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and they were warming themselves Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him. I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards, standing there, struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, 
you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately the cock crowed. And they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him to yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I will release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not, Not this one, one but Barabbas. Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, 
in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was almost noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read the inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified the Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled, that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdala. When Jesus saw them, mother and his disciples there, whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything is now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on the spring of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of the week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, then of the other one.
who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloth, along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now, in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Last night, we began the Paschal Triduum, these, this holy celebration. There's one liturgy. Uh, it began last night. It continues today. It will come to its conclusion, to its fulfillment tomorrow at the Easter Vigil with the resurrection of Jesus. Um, last night, it was so beautiful. I, so many of you were there uh, to mark the beginning of this Triduum as we commemorated the Last Supper. And there was such a warmth, there was such a, a love, there was community, you could feel the presence of God. It was, it was palpable. And I was reflecting, I went afterwards, we had our procession, we processed with the Blessed Sacrament, and we went into the hall to the altar of repose. And I remember just being overwhelmed with um, the evening and the community, and we had 12 disciples, and we had the foot washing, and it was just, as I mentioned, you could really feel the, the presence and the love of God, and, and I had also heard from many of you just that feeling. You were just affirming and acknowledging that presence, and it was just a very moving evening, and as, we, as I was in the, the hall praying, I was very grateful, and I thought, wow, this really came together in such a, a beautiful way. How, how lovely, how wonderful. And then it dawned on me. As I was kneeling in the hall and praying in the hall, in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, as we're commemorating as Jesus was praying just before he was arrested and as he was, he was there with his disciples and they were falling asleep one of his disciples would betray him with a kiss. I was having difficulty reconciling the two because it was such a, a beautiful evening and such a beautiful liturgy, such a beautiful celebration, such a beautiful night, and yet in all of that beauty and all that joy and all that love and the great feeling and the community, what, what were we actually celebrating? Yes, there was the institution of the Eucharist, 
the institution of the, the priesthood, our parish coming together as a community, but, but it was the, the betrayal. It was the beginning of this passion, Jesus being apprehended and being arrested and being beaten and being condemned to death, being crucified, being placed in the grave. And it was difficult for me to celebrate liturgy done so well and so beautiful and here we are, we're having a great experience and it feels so good. And yet the whole movement is the ugliness of our humanity. So that's where I am right now, is just feeling all of these feelings and emotions, the desire, because then I was starting to think, well, we should want to have a good liturgy. We should want to have that community experience, that, that feeling, the love, God's presence in our community, in, in our church, so palpable is a good thing. And shouldn't we try for that? Shouldn't we strive for that? But where does that striving and where does that, that love, where does God's presence, how, how does that begin and end when it's the failure and the corruption of our humanity where sin enters and destroys This is, uh, we're in March. We've got March Madness. It's the basketball, college basketball, and, you know, all of the competition. I, th I think in a certain way that March Madness can exemplify our humanity, right? You know, the competition and competing, and who's the best? Who's, who's the best team? Who's going to win? Who gets the bragging rights? Right? Well, if that's all it is, if our liturgies, if our church, if our lives if that's all it is, is just a bunch of madness, so just a bunch of competing for bragging rights, and look how well I did, look what I've achieved, look how good I am, and, and to, to lord it over someone and to, to make someone else look up to me or us, right? Maybe there's the madness of the world, maybe it's the madness of our own lives, Maybe it's the madness of our, our family systems, competition in the families, right? Looking good. I'm going to get bragging rights in the family. I'm going to look better than somebody else. Look what I've achieved. My education, my job, my house. Or maybe it's bragging rights for our church community. Oh, St. John Eudes is better than this other church or this other parish. Look how good we are, and look what we're doing in our school. Our school is better than your school. Or maybe it's even our country. Oh, our country is better than your country. Our country is succeeding. Our country is successful, and we've won, and we're the best. Right? Look what we've done, and look how much we've achieved. If that's all it is, if that's what it's about, that's what it's about. That is a bunch of madness. It's a bunch of folly. It's empty. But maybe somewhere along the line, it's, you know, there's a, a video I've seen and it, and it talks about how uh, sometimes trees, trees, you know, particularly cedar trees, they can grow and they, their roots are so interconnected and they can take all of the rain that comes up. And those cedar trees, they grow big and tall but they, they take all the rain for themselves. And they just soak up all the, the water, all the resources. And those roots get so interconnected that any rain that's left, left over, it just washes off, washes away like blacktop or like a parking lot. And that rain never really gets a chance to soak into the ground for the benefit of the ground or for... You know, when the drought comes, when the dry season comes, there's no aquifer, there's no underground water, there's no other plants or vegetation. It's just those cedars soak it all up. Look how big I am. Look how great of a tree I am. I just, I was thinking of that one too. 
Or maybe it's the seed. The seed that falls on different types of grounds. Is the seed falling on a parking lot? Is the seed falling on shallow ground? Is it falling on the thorns? Or does that seed actually drop deep into the ground? Does it have a chance to take some root and to grow? I celebrate. I'm so grateful for all of you and everyone who put in hours and such great work for our liturgy last night and for today and for tomorrow and Sunday. All the great time and effort and energy. It, it is beautiful. And you can feel the love. My hope and my prayer for myself, for you, for our parish community, for our church in the whole world, that that the love that's shared, the rain that's pouring down from God's mercy, from heaven, from above, the seed of love that's planted, that it, could, that it could actually be planted deeply in good soil. That the rain could actually soak deep within the ground. That it could renew us. That it wouldn't be wasted. It's not just for a moment of madness. Or a moment of our own glory. But when the difficult time comes, when the cross comes, when the struggles come, when the challenges come, that we're actually going to have something to, to source from, that we're actually going to have love within us to be patient, to be kind, to be forgiving, to be understanding. Like we were talking about last night, 1 Corinthians 13. That there actually could be real love. That love could endure all things. Love could believe all things. That there really will be love. In ourselves, in our church, and in our world. Otherwise, Christ died for nothing. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the holy charts of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed, for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let 
let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Archbishop Jose, his auxiliary bishops, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offering, with new offspring. Increase the faithful and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ that our God and Lord may be pleased as they leave the truth to gather them together and keep them, keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, 
graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our, Le our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, help to the sea, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel.
let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Everyone's invited to be seated. Uh, we have our Good Friday special collection, and just a reminder that this collection uh, is for the Holy Land, and this will help to uh, maintain all of the churches. Uh, we took our, our parish pilgrimage to the Holy Land in June. It was such a gift to be able to go to all of these holy sites that are maintained by the Franciscan community. Um, they received us, there were churches, there were buildings there uh, for us to be able to continue to venerate these holy places. So your contribution today helps to maintain those churches. Thank you. Behold the wood of the cross, 
on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Let us take a few moments to adore in silence this instrument of our salvation on which Jesus Christ demonstrated his love for us by, pouring, by the pouring out of his blood, bringing life to the whole world. Please kneel. Those who wish to come forward for adoration of the cross may reverence with a genuflection or a bow. If you wish to kiss the cross, you may do so, and the altar servers will purify after each reverence. At this time, you may be seated or remain kneeling in silent prayer while we come forward for adoration. We will line up just like we do for communion.
the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope at the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mercy, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. 